Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning in the fourth chapter. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. The, then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you will worship me then, well, wor I will, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all these, had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Who are you? Who are you really? Well, that is kind of an existential question, isn't it? When I was in basic training in the Air Force just a few years ago, a couple of us were pulled out of the training schedule for that day and sent to a building at the very far end of the base. Once inside the room to which we were told to go, we sat down and a man in a civilian, in a civilian suit and tie stood in front of us and began to speak. He told us that he had some forms for us to fill out. Actually, pages and pages and pages. By the time that we would be done, he said, they would know more about us than we knew about ourselves. They would know who we are. Unknown to us, we've been chosen to become investigated for a little higher than top secret security clearance. And if we passed, we would become members of what was called the United States Air Force Security Service, which was essentially an unknown branch of the Air Force and a highly secret agency. So we filled out all the pages and then we waited for the Office of Special Investigations to do their work, investigative work. They had asked for reference after reference of those who we knew. Then they sent investigators to my hometown of Esterville. And they did not speak to even one person that I had listed. But they seemingly spoke to everyone else in town. They found out who was my barber and went to see him and asked him to join them in the car and they quizzed him about me. And later, after he had gone to lunch, they came back and they questioned the other barbers about that barber. Caused quite a stir in that town. 
Everybody was asking my parents, what had I done? Anyway, it probably was true. They probably did know who I was even better than I knew myself. The question that everyone seemed to have about Jesus was, who are you? In his gospel, St. Luke answers the question. St. Luke included many, many clues about the identity of Jesus. One of the clues was the long genealogy that immediately precedes the Holy Gospel for today. The genealogical line goes all the way back to, as the text says, Adam, the Son of God. In true Near Eastern fashion, such a designation would have to be tested and validated to prove that one really was who one was identified to be. And thus, as was expected, soon after being designated as the Son of God, Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested to see if he was indeed the Son of God. In a sense, though, this story really did not begin in the wilderness, but in a garden. It began in the garden when God spoke to Adam and told Adam that he could eat from any of the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam was tested. God placed a boundary around Adam's humanity. Would Adam be a child of God? Or would Adam seek to become God himself? It was quite a temptation. You all know how that story turned out. Adam, the first Adam, transgressed his human boundary and tried to be other than who he was created to be. St. Luke then tells about the testing of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Would he be the son of God? Would he give in to temptation? Would he pass the test and prove to be the son of God? Would Jesus be the son of God, the second Adam, the obedient son of God, who would be a true and accomplish God's will? We'll see. Thus the devil came to Jesus after Jesus had gone without food for a long time, a very long time, for 40 days. To eat bread is to be truly human. Without it, humans die. So we hear the sly words of the devil. If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. This could be easily accomplished by Jesus if he chose to do so. And whereas the first Adam succumbed to the temptation of food offered to him by the devil, the fruit of knowing the difference between good and evil, and proved that in attempting to be God, he was less than God. He tried to break the bonds of humanity. Now the second Adam proved himself to be fully human. He refused to act in his divine nature and thus thwart the will of God. He did not de deny his humanity and turned the stone into bread. Jesus reminded the devil that he lived by God's word. Here is the one who not only lives by the word, but indeed is the word. The one who did not turn the stone into bread, but who was indeed the bread of life himself and gave himself as the bread of life. And thus, in the first temptation, Jesus proved himself to be the Son of God, truly human. 
In the second temptation, the devil came to Jesus and said, Have I got a deal for you? Worship me, and I will give you all the nations of the world over which to rule. What a deal. The devil was, giving, was going to give Jesus a world fallen in sin, a world estranged from God. First Adam was told that he was, in a sense, given the earth, the world as his dominion, over which he could rule. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and, well, over it all. And Adam lost his authority over the earth and fell into sin and lost the glory of being a child of God. What an empty offer the devil made to Jesus. Worship me and it is all yours was Satan's conditional promise. God's promises are not conditional. God first gives freely and then is worshipped. Finally, there came the third and the greatest temptation. Go to Jerusalem, the devil said. In the words of Dr. Art Just, Jerusalem became the place where Jesus was tempted to abandon his vocation of Christ, the Son of God. There in Jerusalem, he would forgo the protection of the Father and his angel armies. Their authority and glory will not come to a miraculous rescue at the temple in Jerusalem or from the cross at Calvary. But by bittersweet abandonment and rejection and a shameful death, there is one way in which Jesus must go in which he will not receive the Father's protection, but rather the Father's wrath. And that is the way of the cross. Each temptation would lead Jesus away from the cross and toward the way of glory. Jesus, though, was obedient to his Father unto death even the death on the cross. And thus, even as the first Adam failed to be obedient to God, the second Adam was obedient and proved to be the Son of God, the one who would be victorious over sin, death, and the devil. It is the nature of temptation to trade the true for the false, as did the first Adam, and as we do each day. Jesus, on the other hand, chose the true and rejected the false. Jesus was and is for us today the Son of God. We like to play God, and we fail. I suppose I could give you instructions about how to avoid falling into temptation. But my advice will fail and so will you. You are still going to follow or fall to the devil's temptations every day, day after day, as we continually choose the way of glory over daily picking up our cross and following Jesus through death to life. We can tell ourselves that, well, we're not really all that bad. And after all, we have good motivations and good intentions for doing what we do. But in the end, day after day, we fall to Satan's temptations. The truth is, we need the one who has overcome all temptations. We need the one who is the Son of God to come to us and to rescue us. 
We need the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who was tempted and proved obedient to the will of his Father, the one who was faithful to his calling regardless of the cost. We need Jesus. The good news for us is that the one who comes to us is the one who chose not the way of glory, but the way of the cross, the one who gave his life for us so that we might have eternal life and not face the second death. We who daily choose the way of the first Adam, the way of sin, the way of disobedience to God, have been chosen by God the Father to live in the way of his Son. Each day that old sinful person who in spite of our best intentions fails again and falls again to temptation and into sin and is drowned, as we saw this morning, by the water of holy baptism. And each day for the sake of Jesus, the Son of God, God, the Holy Spirit, raises us up to new life as a new person, the one who chose the cross because of us and for us, joins us in our suffering and promises a new life in his reflected glory. After the cross comes the resurrection. One of the most powerful moments in the movie, The Passion of Christ, you may remember that of a few years ago, is in the garden. Notice it's not in the wilderness, but once again in the garden. When one of the most beguiling and seductive voice tempts Jesus once again for the last time to abandon his identity as the Son of God and his obedience to God and his task of going to the cross. And for the last time, Jesus, the new Adam, resisted this final temptation, took up the cross, died, and gave us new life. We are in the midst of our lifelong Lenten journey of being tempted. It is a journey in which Jesus daily suffers with us. We are, tempt we are tempted to avoid the journey. We are tempted to avoid the suffering as we daily give in to temptation. But we also live daily in the promise of the one who was obedient to his Father, whose words in that garden were, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that will is that we, children of the first Adam, receive the new life that is ours in Jesus Christ, and that we are brothers and sisters of the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. And that, children of God, is who you are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.